are here to talk about interoperability and usability, um, topics near and dear to my heart. Um, so I have an incredibly esteemed set of panelists here, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves um, in a second and really talk about a little bit about the work that they're doing and, and why it's relevant to this topic. Um, but first, I wanted to say a little bit about, so I'm the one standing at the podium. I'm not the one that has the interesting things to say, but, um, but, I, but I do, again, um, care very deeply about, about this topic. And so for those of you that don't know me, I, um, I started the Open Badges work um, through Mozilla Foundation in 2010. Um, and so uh, I'm, I'm assuming in this conference most people have at least heard of that work or um, have a little bit of understanding, but it was really a, an effort to reimagine um, how we credential learning at a granular level. Um, but the most important piece of it, the open piece of open badges, was we wanted to do it in a way that learning across any context um, could be badged and those badges could sit next to each other um, in that learner's portfolio. So the, the interoperability was kind of baked in from the beginning. So one of the first things that we did at Mozilla was create the Open Badges standard, which was effectively um, the, the information model or metadata specification for, for all badges everywhere. So um, that, I think that decision of starting at that point has really um, enabled uh, that ecosystem to grow considerably. I mean, I think the um, most recent uh, data that we've had is something over like 25,000 organizations are issuing or using badges in some way. And again, that spans from higher ed institutions to NASA to small nonprofits to corporations, and and all of those badges can sit next to each other um, in a in a portfolio or or be used across um, different tools because of that that interoperability piece that standard. So anyway, that's that's kind of where I come from. Um, certainly, my perspective um, looking at, at everything. Um, but again, we're you know we're here to talk about more than just badges. We're here to talk about um, you know academic credentials um, writ large, and, it, and the parallel uh, session is actually uh, talking about all of the, you know, badges, uh, certifications, credentials, um, uh, you name it. Uh, so here, we're going we're gonna to really spend some time on what does interoperability look like across, across this uh, wild west that we live in these days, um, and, and, and sort of, you know, kind of how do we, how do we get to the vision. So, <clears throat> That's all you're going to hear from me other than some questions. Um, so let's start by uh, having everybody sort of introduce yourself, what you're working on, and kind of how that's relevant to uh, interoperability usability topics. Joelle? All right. Uh, my name is Joellen Evernham Shendi. I'm the Associate Vice Provost and Registrar at University of Maryland University College. And I have spent the last year working on with IMS Global. Um, and a bunch of other colleagues uh, working on an extended transcript for competency-based education, essentially, and developing a pilot prototype. Uh, and my interest is in uh, giving students more agency over their own record and finding better ways to support transparency in higher education. That speaks to the value. I think um, Dr. Carnavale did an amazing job this morning at setting a wonderful stage and a platform for us, and everything he said I would echo. Uh, and that's that's essentially my interest in this. Hi, I'm <laughs> closer, closer. I'm Diana Oblinger. I'm the president emeritus of Educause. Just retired a few months ago. Um, Educause, as you may know, is a professional association for higher education and IT, with the emphasis on what you do with IT that counts, not the IT per se. Um, my interest has been through standards such as IMS. Um, which was um, part of EDUCOM in the old days, uh, an outgrowth of that. Also with innovative programs, you, if you were in the last session, heard Brandman University, you've heard UMUC, lots of different organizations. Um, the EDUCAUSE organization worked with the Gates Foundation on a big project called the Next Generation Learning Challenges that's still going on that has touched many institutions with a variety of different innovations. And the third area of interest of mine is around um, global education. Educause worked uh, in 40 different countries and there's some very interesting things going on in other parts of the world that impact uh, both American higher education and the work workforce. I'm Mark Luba, I'm Vice President of Product Management with IMS Global Learning Consortium. We arrived at digital credentials through the competency-based education network partnership that we de was developed last, the beginning of last year. Now, we, le we led a research project involving limits to scalability in the 
plat in the platform and infrastructure for CBE schools, and um, that spawned a number of projects. The, the one of which, probably the most important of which, is the digital credentialing project. And th there are three components to that. One is open badges and support for the open badge ecosystem, uh, much as as um, we've spoken about today. The second component is an e-transcript, which we view as a collection of badges, um, a collection of obviously course records or competency records that we will need to support both of these types of models, certainly. And then finally, the comprehensive learner record. We see the comprehensive learner record as digital, as student controlled, and um, containing both transcripts that the learner has received over the course of their um, education career, as well as the badges themselves. Now, I say containing. Uh, technically, all that will be contained, we believe, in the comprehensive learner record are links. Links to the actual documents which will be stored or hosted either in a secure repository behind a firewall or potentially on a Credly platform or a claim, et cetera. So we envision this portfolio being um, the end direction, the end game for all of this uh, digital credentialing. All, and it's all about portability. The importance of standards, because you know the nature of this panel, is completely around the student's ability to move their credentials from one vendor platform to another. Uh, the worst thing that would, could happen at this stage, or almost any stage, of course, would be vendor lock-in. So what's critically important is that the vendors come together, work, working with members and collaborating across associations to develop a common in data infrastructure that can be shared uh, across multiple vendor products. And we, we are working on that right now, and with the help of UMUC and other schools, plan to have a live pilot before the end of this year. I'm uh, Bob Sheets. I'm with the George Washington Institute of Public Policy, uh, working on a project with my colleague Steve Crawford, who is here today, along with uh, ANSI and WorkCred, called the Credential Transparency Initiative, funded by Lumina, which is to create an online registry uh, of credential information about credentials. So it's a three-part project. One is to develop common terminology to describe all types of credentialing organizations and credentials. So think of the full rambit of people who issue credentials, not the credential holders, mm -hmm. but people who issue and provide some sort of verification for holders of credentials. So think about all the wide varieties. So we're looking upon everything from degrees, certificates, badges, certifications, Anything you can imagine that people talk about uh, attestations of what you know and can do as issued by a credentialing organization. So it's a three-part project is to build a common terminology. So think in terminology as metadata, like standards that we're going to be talking about, that requires the harmonization of existing terminology and vocabularies across the different silos of credentials who have their own communities of practice, who have their own language that they don't think is uh, it, they think is interoperable in the sense of it's only in their community. So that's number one. Number two is use that based upon the principles of linked data to establish a registry of comparable information on all types of credentialing, an uh, open voluntary registry to create a data infrastructure that allows people to do an applications marketplace on top for people to use that information and also make connections between platforms, uh, people who hold credentials, like the badge platforms, mm -hmm. so that we have better interoperability across all these tools. And so we can have search and discovery, comparison, data analytics, these application tools. So we're very interested in the, the harnessing the power of standards in the marketplace to create be better interoperability between systems that have historically operated in silos. Yes. Nice. So before we get into standards specifically, let's, let's talk a little bit about why, why we should care about interoperability and what we mean, sort of what's the vision. Um, and I thought maybe, Diana, you could start. You have probably the most macro view um, of everyone here. So just a little bit about what's, what's the vision, what, what do we mean when we're talking about interoperability? 
I, I think the point here is about usability and scalability without standards, without common definitions, without uh, technical interoperability. Um, we don't make the market. And I think what we heard, heard this morning is all about their, their students, their institutions, their employers, there's a great gap. How do you begin to connect those? And you can't do that unless you have a legitimate way of talking and exchanging information. So I think it's, it's a lot about connecting the dots. Um, it's at multiple different levels, of course. There's experience, there's validation, there's curation of those records. There's also promotion. A lot of our students are promoting themselves on social media. Employers are finding people by going out on online talent platforms like LinkedIn, like Monsters. So it's about having that common language to connect for the sake of scalability and usability. Um, I th think that there are a couple of additional things that are embedded in standards that I, I would just call out and won't take um, a lot of time to really talk about them um, right now. But one of the points behind standards, I think, are what are the assumptions that you are building those standards on? Is the assumption of a, a course, a three credit course, I think what we're seeing in the world is the assumptions that we build a lot of our systems around um, no longer necessarily hold true because we have entirely different models. So I think an important part of the standards discussion is not just how do you create those standards, but what are you basing them on? What kind of metaphor, what kind of mental model are you using? because the world is changing and some of our old mental models may not be appropriate. Another important element, I think, is around how do you do it? Uh, it used to be that we developed these massive systems with millions of, millions of lines of code. They were very monolithic. Now the metaphor of the day is much more around a mashup or how do you connect different things. I think that's, that's another element. But the final one that I would put out on the table for us to touch on is it's not just about technical standards, it's not just about interoperability, but it's the human systems that allow that entire marketplace to work. Because if you don't come to common data definitions, which is very much a people-intensive process, you can't even have the beginnings. But there's who's the audience, who are you trying to serve? Is it the traditional student? Is it the employer, the non-traditional student? Is it international? How do you think about how people work? So badges, who owns the badge? How do they carry it? How big is it? A, a bunch of really important questions, I think, to be thought about behind who is the audience, what's the metaphor, and how do they use it? Another important part about the human factor is the workflow. How do people actually do their work? If we don't match the system to the way people actually do the work, uh, probably not going to help. Awareness and adoption are really critical. Once you've got some of these systems, you've got to educate people. One of the critical issues around scalability is people have to change their belief system. Do we believe this new system is going to work? And many of us are skeptics, so where's the data? How do you understand what it is? And then how do you educate people? There's a really important process beyond standards of ongoing education. And part of that is conversations and challenging each other. So I would use those as a few important points mm -hmm. for how we have this conversation about uh, not just standards, but ultimately the impact of scalability and usability. Great. And I, I definitely want to dig into some of those as we go a little deeper. So, so, I, so I'm hearing usability, scalability, and Mark, you mentioned portability. Um, any other thoughts on the kind of big vision that we're working towards um, with interoperability as a whole? I, I, I think we're, we're, uh, we're, we're getting the issue of, of interoperability from a sense building of exchange of information between heterogeneous systems. I think we're, we're through that. Right now issue is semantic interoperability. Yep. Yep. And now we have people that have historically done idiosyncratic vocabularies about their data systems that were closed to data systems or data systems that were closed within a community. Think of higher education. We have common terminology we've always used that's not jargon to anybody, of course, right? Because we're in the community of using that vocabulary on a consistent basis. We're over that now in the World Wide Web. We have to latch on to vocabularies that are used broadly. Think of schema.org. Mm -hmm. 
we've got to use with, with vocabularies that are widely adopted by audiences and users that are outside our traditional silos, and that allows data to be mashed up and reused in ways in which we never intended. Yep. So in other words, I think with the, the link, what I'm, the vision of the World Wide Web as a, a web of data mm -hmm. is really telling us that we have to move toward controlled vocabularies that are widely used in the marketplace based upon use cases. And I think that semantic interoperability is our challenge of the future, not the technical exchange of data between disparate systems. And maybe, and, and so how do we do that? So uh, how do we, uh, what's the process look like to get to a standard, especially around when we start to get into semantics where we're gonna have to draw some lines that probably is gonna be exclusionary in some ways. How do we make sure we have the right voices, the right use cases at the table to start to create those kinds of things? I was thinking, I don't have the answer to that one, but I, there's two issues that I think about every day. Yep. One is if you don't build off uh, the common terminology of the major search engines, like mm -hmm. if you don't build off what's the leadership of the World Wide Web Consortium, the principles of linked data, and if you don't build off the schema.org vocabularies that we can, we can elaborate on. But second of all, we have some excellent standardization organizations. Uh, the yep. work my, Mark does and others. I think the most important challenge now is get those standardization organizations to work together. So like we have a standardization organization going on in the human resource information system world. We have standardization organizations working in the transcript world. We have standardization work in different parts. And now I think with the credentialing marketplace that Tony laid out, mm -hmm. we've got to now break down any sort, uh, we have to have more uh, what we call synergies between the existing standardization groups who are doing really great work. Yep. Mark, you want to say something? Uh, uh, yes, thank you. I definitely agree that it's a two-pronged challenge. The semantic interoperability is huge and, and definitely more challenging uh, than the technical interoperability. And Bob referred to the fact that that problem has been solved. And I would agree that the standards do exist that inf will allow us to build out a web of, of data, as he referred to it. But unfortunately, the standards are not uniformly applied. And what we find is that um, uh, there may be six, eight, ten, let's use badging platforms, for example. And the vision of badging, the promise of badging, is that the learner can take their badge and move it to platforms of their choice, Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever display platform, Credly, it's a claim. Uh, but in reality, that promise has not been realized. And so what that calls for, of course, is a mechanism to provide a compliance certification. And so the, the ability to verify that a particular platform is in fact compliant. Um, that happens to be something that IMS is very focused on. We provide that service for all of, all of the um, standards that we publish and we'll actually be providing that service for the open badge specification as well in the near future. But um, I definitely agree the, the uh, standard is in place, but the practical uh, operationalizing of that standard is still work to be done. So we're, we're talking a lot in the abstract about interoperability standards, and I thought um, one perspective that Joanne really brings to the table is, is kind of helping us get real for a second and really talk about what kind of impact that this can have um, within a, a particular university and, and sort of how that usability um, and adoption happens. So sure, get away. Um, so I guess I, I bring the practicality component here. How many of you have ever been told, I'm sorry, the system can't do that? <laughs> Nobody? Everybody. Everybody's been told that. So if I say nothing else, you'll know that that's the reason that standards are so critical, because that should never be an answer that you should be hearing. Uh, and that, that's the challenge. So we can talk about you know technically making things talk to each other. I, it is a, a little bit of a puzzle. Um, higher ed has a lot of systems that are siloed and we have a lot of people that are siloed and you wonder which parallel what. But uh, from the point of view of someone who has to use systems, so I have to grab data from multiple different places and make it appear as if by magic, because I'm a registrar and we do lots of magic, as if by magic and produce something essentially for the student. But underneath the covers, that's not quite as easy as it might appear. So I think um, Diana noted that the old kind of monolithic systems of the past are, are old, frankly. So, and 
those of you, so we have PeopleSoft, which is kind of a, a bigger monolithic type system, right? I mean, it is an enterprise system, but it is very difficult to make changes in there. It's not impossible, but it's certainly somewhat challenging. And as we add new systems into the university infrastructure and the ecosystem, all of those systems have to communicate with each other. And sometimes it's the smallest things that can trip you up, like uh, if you're trying to transfer data from an enterprise system to a learning management system, that system needs to understand the, stu the student uh, data and like the term. So it doesn't do me any good to transfer student data, but not data about what the student is actually taking or the term they're taking it in. Uh, and so those are very simple sort of examples of where interoperability gotchas kind of come in. Uh, and I think currently right now too, most people will talk to a lot of different vendors. There's a lot of different software available and everybody will tell you, don't worry, you can just plug it in. You can just put an API over here, go over here and do that. And again, it's not so easy. So um, while it might appear on the surface, things work well together, that's not the case with everything. And in order for, for me, as an end user, right, I don't make standards, I don't have any technical competence to do that, uh, but I can certainly say, look, I want to have that piece of data from that system and that piece of data from that system and that one over there, and I want it to come together and I want to produce something that adds value to the student, to their education and to their learning. And so if I don't have standards, I will never get there because all the money in the world is not going to custom craft me an ecosystem that is that will really really work uh, and so there that the end user and I know Diana you talked as well about um, what's the workflow look like well right now a lot of workflows amongst systems are very manual because you can only get so far because they only speak in a certain type of language so we've got to conquer all the hurdles from the technical hurdles to the semantic hurdles um, in order to get where we where we want to go great and I, I think Mark had said to me uh, right before this that the, the best standards are the invisible standards, yep. so the ones that um, operate behind the scenes and that sort of end users don't, uh, don't even know that they're there. So you know they're there because you have to deal with them. But <laughs> So maybe Mark, can, can you say a few words about, um, again, kind of like wh what goes into building a, a good standard like that, an invisible standard? What does it take? You know, what, how, do you, how do people know? Um, you know, which standard to go with, which one to trust, how to choose, um, maybe say a couple words about that process that you guys involved. Well, the, uh, two questions there. The first about how the process works is, uh, you know, it starts with a really def well-defined need, usually some, some uh, champions, mm -hmm. and IMS is a member-based organization, so 360 or so um, higher ed institutions, software product companies, and, and K-12 um, districts, et cetera. And so we form, what we do at IMS is we facilitate the coming together of these parties and guide them through a process of creating a common specification which will define the information that is to be exchanged. So it's, it's actually quite simple uh, at, at the 50,000 feet level. Of course, it, it can get complex. But the question about um, you know, which standard should people use, uh, standards change over time. Uh, technologies change over time. I'm not sure how many people here may have record albums at home. Uh, I, I certainly do. And they're coming back, by the way, so I'll, <laughs> yeah, I'll, take, yeah. I'll take every one you have. Yeah. But you know, record albums, analog, uh, transition to CDs, digital. Mm -hmm. But now, most of us, I would argue, stream our music. So we don't actually have a copy of our music. We, we stream it. And so with the advent of the cloud and tools like Google Docs and linked data, the, it's a total reversal of what was possible in the old model where you had to take either a piece of paper or a PDF or even a file variation, that XML file, and ship it, a copy of that, to another party. Well, that means the student's data is actually physically being broadcast over the internet. Now, personally, we, we believe that a model where that information is resident behind a secure firewall, perhaps a custodian, perhaps at the, at the institution's own system, and all you share would be a link. And that link is secure and is only intended to be used by the recipient. So there is a trusted and enforceable relationship between you sharing that access to your document in the domain or the user that's able to view it. 
And so uh, there, there's a lot different with that model than the historical model. So technology breeds change. And so um, to me, we should be leaning forward to leverage the web of data that Bob talked about. Great. And so uh, we're going to open up for questions in a, in a few minutes. But um, so let's say we just sold everybody here on standards. Everybody here is uh, at this conference because they're thinking about um, innovating around academic credentials in some way. Um, we sold them on interoperability. Now what? Where, what does it mean? Like, how do you get started with standards? Where do you go? What do you do? Maybe, Joellen, you want to sure. say a few words about that and anyone else? Too? Yeah. Um, what I would say, there, there's two pieces here, and I think it, sometimes people get them confused. So technology can drive innovation, but it should also support it. And it's not really an exclusive relationship on either. Uh, and so if you, for people who are interested or if you want to, uh, like, how do you go about this? You start to coalesce, you grab people, right? And you start to coalesce around an idea about what it is that you want. And then you start to work together to start uh, creating requirements. So I can share what we did in the past year. So we had about seven or eight different institutions, very different it's from proprietary to big us. We're a big public online. We had. University of Michigan, you know, uh, different levels of institutions got together and we started to define what are the requirements we'd like to see if we were going to develop a new form of extended transcript that got more at um, the learning outcomes or the competencies of the student. And we actually partnered with, the, with a lot of the different vendors that are in IMS Global to figure out where we wanted to go. And I think what, what I would say about the process is um, previously I think my experience with uh, vendors has been it's kind of a you and a them, um, an I and, an, and a you or a me and an, uh, the other. It's always this sort of, well, I'm getting something from you and I'm paying you for something, you're going to give it to me and then it's kind of a contractual relationship. Uh, but what we discovered actually is it doesn't have to be that way and so we had everybody at the table talking and brainstorming and I personally think that that's what that is going to be needed in higher ed. I mean, we talked about this morning talk about the kind of triad. So it's not only higher education institution to higher education institution, but it's employers and feedback loops and assessing and changing and being agile. And that's that's kind of what we did in the work group is we just we got together and started to just kind of knock things out um, and work together to create what those requirements should be. And then the tech tech folks kind of went from there and they did all this stuff. It was actually kind of cool. There was actually at one point two like green screens of data and I was all wargaming. It was very excellent, uh, but I didn't really, I don't really do the tech part. Uh, but that's essentially how you go about it. I mean, it, there's a little bit of a grassroots feel, I think, to it right now even. Uh, but as we start to see more things come along, like this credential transparency initiative and the changes you're starting to see, then if you went to the, the the last session uh, with Elon producing a new, I mean, people are starting to innovate in the field. And so if you're, I mean, if you're interested, you just grab colleagues and you find a boat and you get in and you set sail and you just start working um, and you find people that are going to support you. That, that's probably a very practical <laughs> viewpoint. Um, and I like yeah. sailing, so it's all good. <laughs> but I, I, I'd like, just to add, I agree with everything you said. I'd like to add another angle is, is one, one problem I think most institutions are struggling with now, and we struggle with in our project, is scope. You select standards based upon your position within a marketplace. And if you think your position is going to be only one type of credential called a degree, mm -hmm. then you'll scope it differently, right? And you'll look at the standardization bodies that allow you to do that, right? But what if you think, and the, like I'm, 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 I'm fascinated by hearing stories from registrars who get stuff from mm -hmm. students and they go, what is that, mm -hmm. right? And then they go on their campuses and go, you know, my campus is putting out all these credentials that never come through the registrar. They're putting out certificates, uh, badges. Uh, these uh, people are going rogue on me over there in that college over there. They're putting out credentials left and right. I don't even know. I can't even, I got to do an inventory of credentials. And so what I'm finding is that how you scope your problem and the use cases you come up with, like examples, like, like examples, that leads you to the search for the standards that will do the job you need to get done. A minute, the degree of semantic interoperability is always a function of the job to be done, yes. right? Good enough, I want to have shared meaning, good enough for what I want to get done. And so I urge, scope your position in the marketplace, 
design the standardization around that scope, dealing with concrete use cases that you see student records that you're getting, you're getting now. And also think about, it was a great presentation earlier, when you start embedding certifications into your own credentials, that redefines the scope of interoperability, right? So I guess I'm saying scope, use cases, working off concrete examples of representing cross-section of what you're dealing with now. Yep. And if, if I can add um, two elements that go out a little bit further, um, as, as Bob said, you know, you, you need to get the job done. And in the last session, they talked about the job being done to help people be found. Um, so from an employer perspective. So let me jump to the other side of the equation. There's um, the emergence of another um, new set of tools that are called online talent platforms, and most of us would be familiar with LinkedIn or Monster.com. And so talking about use cases, with these online talent platforms that could really transform the workplace globally, there are three different levels to, to think about matching individuals to traditional jobs, full-time jobs. And I think we're already having some discussions about that. Another really massive marketplace that we need to be thinking about in that use case scenario is matching people to the contingent workforce, part-time. Think about Uber. Think about Uber not just being a um, way to get uh, something that's better than a taxi, but it being a way to find people who want part-time work. Uh, and it's not just Uber, there are a whole number of different platforms out there. And again, um, when we think about credentials, those of us that come from higher education tend to think in terms of entire degree programs or certificate programs, things that are big. You may have the smaller element that you need to be thinking about. And worldwide, that may be a much larger piece of the overall equation than sort of the traditional workplace. And then there's sort of a, a talent management um, angle to it. So as we think about use cases, again, the metaphor that we use, how we define it may be really important. And I would just put out there that we need to think about these online talent platforms um, that are emerging. Um, uh, there's a McKinsey report that talks about it having a huge impact on gl um, worldwide global domestic product. Part of that is because people will find new jobs sooner because they're in the marketplace. They find a better fit. Uh, there's less downtime between jobs. And it's also about finding jobs that you might not have found before. So that's one element of use cases is to think about that online talent marketplace. The other is to think about the linkage to um, policy. In Singapore, um, a few months ago, they announced a new program that's called Skill Future. And what it is, they've looked at their workplace, they've looked at the educational system, and to keep pace in Singapore, they believe that they need um, basically continuing education credits. So every worker in Singapore is now able to earn $500 per year. Sounds like a small amount, but you know, think about differences in, in the cultures and the economies that they can use for continuing education credit. They're incenting the higher education institutions to begin offering that so that people will do a better job of not just having a credential, but knowing what next credential they need, being able to identify where it is and how to pay for it. So again, when it comes to the use case and ultimately where we are going, I just suggest that maybe we need to test our metaphors of how far those boundaries are going because that marketplace may move yeah. much faster than we had thought. Um, in as much as we, we think sometimes I think about new markets, uh, there are some markets that we could much better serve. So when we talk as institutions of higher education, we, we do talk about degrees, right? Uh, bachelor's associate, bachelor, master's. But we, we have a huge chunk of, of students who have not finished. Um, and if you talk to many of them, the words that come out of their mouth are, are very often associated with failure, right? I mean, you can be three units away, but you're a failure because you're not done. And that's how we see them. They're like half-baked cookies, right? And you're just like, no, no matter what, I'm just not going to eat those cookies because they're just not done. But what if we used the tenets of standards and transparency and portability and started to think about, well, what what type of value, though, have they already earned at, through learning? So they're not 
they're not, it's not like you only get to the end when you get to the very end. You're building along the way. And so by creating different uh, transparent forms of credentials, whatever you want to call them, right, you actually could start to get at some of the issues that have been plaguing higher ed forever. We have dropout rates. We have people when we, where we don't retain people. We have adults who need 12 units, and they've been out for 10 years, and now it's a struggle to get them back in because we want more degree attainers. That's your ticket, middle class life, job, yada, yada. So we could do a lot more at making what they've completed and done more transparent, and doing that also can help demonstrate their value. So it's not only potentially a new market or a new way of thinking. Um, don't forget the, the, the people that already exist, the situations that exist for which some of these new and innovative models um, that require uh, you know, us to be able to be more transparent and find new ways to have systems talk and to present data can, a, can potentially have a very big impact on current issues that exist right now for students. Yeah, if I can say that, uh, Bill, on Darren's point, is the most important thing is make your credentials, you as a credentialing organization and your credential holders, visible on the web, easily searchable, in which the data on your credential, your credentialing organization, and your credential holders can be ingested into the new talent platforms easily so, your so you can be tracked and identified through the new talent management global tools. So the very most important, if you're not on the World Wide Web of data, in the future you won't be discoverable, and you're, the information about your credentialing organization, your credential, and the credential holders that you give information to will not be discoverable and easily integrated into these new talent platforms. Yes, I'm vigorously shaking my head. I want to give you all high fives. So let's, um, let's open it up for questions from, from the audience. Um, anybody, some burning questions? Yeah, yeah. Um, hi, I'm from, oh, sorry. Okay. I'm coming at this from a perspective of a state agency. So I work for the Illinois Board of Higher Education. And we're interested in looking more closely at these credential, this credential marketplace to assess whether we should be counting some of these credentials towards state completion goals. Yes. So <laughs> we're excited about it. And we know there's, lot, there's tens of thousands of credential holders in our state. Mm -hmm. But our thought is, OK, and we're going to work closely with Bob on, on his project, which we're extremely excited about. And we're hoping that will give us the tools to assess these as a state. And we understand once we make those distinctions, we're putting a value judgment on these credentials. Could you talk a little bit about maybe perspectives a state should consider as they're looking at making these type of assessment decisions? Anyone want to jump on that? Go ahead. No, go ahead. I mean, uh, you guys keep. I, I, I think it's, it's, it's uh, and, and thanks for bringing that up because I, it kind of hits a little bit on um, the stuff that I mentioned earlier about what percent of even in of our traditional higher educational institutions, what percent of all of their credential information is in any centralized, even an old data system? What percent? And I would suggest that it is less than 50 and it's the share is getting smaller and smaller. Those are the credentials that a state is going to want to know about and count. And then on top of that, you have other types of credentials that a state wants to know about that are never, they're not in any existing reporting system to the state at all. There's, and so it's not only invisible to the institution, it's not like the institution's trying to hide anything, it's just that they don't collect all that stuff. So think about all the different certificates that are put out by institutions that are not even centrally controlled. Uh, so the issue is, I, I see it as getting uh, institutions to have a different data infrastructure internally and also have it so that, and also think about all the different institutions that report three or four different times to the same entity with different definitions, right? Think of the, the cost of all that reporting. So I think what it is, the most important thing is to have the states work with all institutions to move toward a common data inf infrastructure on credentialing as a whole in ways that the state can grab information and have comparable information about any credential to make their own decision on which ones would count based on the broad lumina definition of high quality credentials. But I think that unless we get with the data infrastructure thing first, we're not even gonna be counting or even knowing about half of the stuff that's even in the traditional marketplace that's even being put out there. 
And that semantic infrastructure feels really important to, especially at that level, so that you're not evaluating necessarily every single potential credential out there, but you're sort of bucketing things and, and sort of make, you know, defining policy or what have you around those. Um, next question. Hi, I'm Megan Adams from EAB. We just completed a research study on competency-based education, and as we talked to a number of first movers out in the field, what they told us, one of the biggest difficulties they encountered was the cost of running the back office. How do you automate transcripts? How do you automate bill pay? How do you get the SIS to talk to LMS about competencies? Wondering from the panel, how far away do you think the market is from automating those processes? Um, I mentioned at the beginning of the panel today that um, I led a research project that was, happened, was funded by the Gates Foundation for the Competency-Based Education Network and its purpose, the project was called TIP, Technical Interoperability Pilot, and you can, you can uh, Google it, Educause TIP, and you'll see the initial report. The, the purpose was to identify barriers to scale among the 35 institutions that comprise CBEN. And we, we ultimately, as I mentioned, boiled it down to some use cases that we could actually, um, we could actually uh, you know, pursue. But um, the, the technical barriers are very real. Um, our assessment is that the, the large uh, enterprise student information systems, for example, which uh, together as a group do not support competencies uh, at the same level as courses, uh, they're probably 18 months out before the, you'll start, you'll see a fully operational support for competencies in those platforms. Um, so if I was a CIO or a provost or uh, other administrative leader looking to get into, the, into CBE, I'd have to ask myself the question, um, what niche innovative platforms that may be narrow in scope but still very functional might I consider to perform certain of those same jobs? So you start to think about the best of breed strategy. And in that, in that model where you need to acquire a third party, a third product that may perform, you know, student onboarding, possibly uh, integration with a, a financial aid system or other other back office function, um, interoperability standards become central to your decision. Because after all, what, what the standards allow you to do is change quickly and at a lower price. A fun, so if you have a plug and play standard like LTI, for example, um, you're able to put aside one system and bring on another system at a relatively low cost because it bolts right on from an interoperability perspective. So um, yes, there, there's still, I believe, about 18 months before we'll start to see um, operationalized versions of CBE support among the larger vendors, uh, but there are options that um, are available. I think we have time for one more quick question. Mine was just be a quick, maybe you can get to it. I wanted to just go back to a comment Bob made, um, Mike Sessa from PESC, by the way, uh, about, and, and, and Mark, you had said it too, and Diane and Joellen, about best in breed and interoperability and plug and play. I think what we need is a commitment to not create new definitions and to scan the landscape to see what might be out there. I think there's a cultural change that needs to happen with interoperability. Interoperability requires recyclability, reusability, and the biggest thing we have in higher education, I call them thiefdoms. <laughs> it wasn't built here, that's not ours. We just got a big grant. Look at our definitions. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying, we got a nice grant and we're gonna pull together everything that's already out there and available. Yeah. And that's what we're not doing right now. I, I, I think it's, if I can comment on that, yeah. the, I think the lesson of the World Wide Web is reuse existing vocabulary. If you don't, you're going to be marginalized. Yep. And if there's one rule of schema.org and others, is if you don't build off the ontology frameworks and all that sort of stuff. Yep. And if you look at the world of search, search is going toward ontology-based mm -hmm. search, right? Mm -hmm. So if you don't build up into vocabulary, so if you don't get outside your institutional 
higher ed look and say, how do I fit the larger credentialing marketplace? What is the common terminology out there currently I can build and extend from? You are not going to be built on, you're not going to build to, to get to the issues of search, reusability. You're not going to get there. Your proprietary closed systems are going to not do anything for your, the people that matter, your students. If you don't build open systems based upon reuse terminology, you are not giving all of your students the opportunities they need to do in a, in a new credentialing marketplace. So I would just add something. As someone who's examined, I don't know, two million course descriptions over the course of 30 <laughs> years in higher education, I'll give you an example of that something came up with a, with a student uh, for me actually many years ago. So the learning outcome of the course was understand financial statements, which, okay, that's great. It's a financial accounting course. That's a very common outcome. The, and this might sound really silly, but the employer was looking for somebody who could create a balance sheet and analyze a PE ratio and stuff. And all of these things are wrapped up sort of in these understanding of financial statements. But it was, if you were gonna match it, and right now there's a lot of matching happening electronically, it would totally miss. Mm -hmm. You would just 100% miss on that. And that's, that's so tiny and so small, but could be pivotal for the students. So when we're talking about semantics and ontology, you've just, you've got to, we've got to be able to start speaking the same language from an employer point of view, from a university point of view, and from a student point of view. And all three, right, elements of that triad need to be working together and being able to articulate clearly uh, like what students know and can do in ways that have meaning to everybody and that aren't exclusive to any one element. I, I, if I build on that, you I'll say on the private side now, there, there are a lot of vendors are, are selling competency management systems internally yeah. to manage information about their employees. They're selecting taxonomies, frameworks to use for that. And we have to have now conversations between the credentialing community and the employer community to make sure we, we can use common taxonomies yeah that allow the interoperability to happen better. So we can't say within our higher education world and say we can create our own vocabulary that's gonna be used by the world. We gotta get in, in be lar part of the larger credentialing marketplace of which the employer community has to be a part of it. Yes. Well, thank you guys. We are, we are out of time. Um, you guys are wonderful and are doing very important work. So thanks to our panelists. Um, thank you.